Okay, we should be okay now. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, and thank you all for agree for coming and participating in whatever way you're participating in our Members Matter meetings. We, we really like to do this. We, we like to get out to where you are and have an opportunity to network um, with our membership. So I think the first thing we'd like to do is maybe go around the room here at the State Library and ask people who are here at the State Library to identify themselves. And then we'll ask Julia to identify who's participating online. So Susan, you want to start? Sure thing. That'd be great. Um, I'm Susan Palmer. I'm from Illinois Heart and Library System. I'm the Operations Director. Uh, I'm Laura Hendrickson. I'm the librarian over at the Illinois EPA. Also on the Executive Council for the Special Library Representative. I'm Amy Byers. I'm the Director at Chatham Mary Public Library. I'm Rick Meyer, Executive Public Library. Good morning. I'm Leslie Bender with Illinois Heart and Library System. And I'm Ellen Poppett, as I said. Anna Yakko, Illinois Heartland Library System. Sean Lay, SIU Medical Library. Greg McCormick from the Illinois State Library. Beth Boots from Boyd's Bell Kitchen Memorial Library. Joe Nishini, Library at Kitchen Memorial Library. Joe Natale, Illinois State Library. Hi, I'm Karen Egan from the Illinois State Library. I'm Maria Stevens with the Illinois State Library. I'm Pat Berg with the Illinois State Library. Julia, who do you see online? Okay. Well, I'm Julia with IHLS. Um, I'm just going to read the, the list of names as they're, they're on here. So far, we have 30 people online, but a lot of those are the State Library people. So <laughs> we have Sarah Gentle with Morora. Let me see. Arlana Fries, Anna Yackel. Ashley Stewart, Bobby Perriman from Vesperin, Brett Winchester, Brenda Gilpatrick, Diane Yeoman from Mason City, uh, Dr. Pamela Thomas, we have Elaine from Morrison Talbot, Aaron from Crab Orchard, Esther Curry from C.E. Brem, Felicia Murray, we have Heather. Holly from Brighton, uh, Hugh Westbrooks, Janet from Carlinville. We have Jill, um, Fairview Heights, Joanne Bauer, Lauren Irwin from Hainer. We have M. Richards. I'd have to look at the attendance sheet for that one. We have Noel from Maryville, Pam from West. Frankfurt, Sandy West, Shauna Maki from O'Fallon Public, and Shelley Stone. Thanks, Julia. And to all the people who are online, um, we really encourage you, anytime you have a question or want to make a comment, please enter it in the chat, or if you have a microphone, don't hesitate to speak up. Our goal is to make all these meetings as interactive as we possibly can. So never hesitate um, to make, make your opinion known. We really, we really would like that. Um, I'm going to start out by talking about some things that are going on um, in the upcoming months. And you know, you think about, oh, it's January, it's February. These are the doldrums kinds of things. Um, not really so much. It's going to be a busy couple of months ahead of us. And so um, I sent last night to those of you who had registered, and it's on L2 in the listing for today, a document called Mark Your Calendars. And hopefully I've hyperlinked everything I can hy hyperlink for you um, about upcoming events that are, th are there for your consideration. A couple of things I want to highlight. Um, the second event in our roadside training series that's designed to bring continuing education opportunities to our membership is an online um, session called Library Management Basics. And that's going to be a session designed for newish directors or directors who, who just want to learn more about some of the basics required for Librarianship 101. So some of the finance pieces, some of the management pieces, 
Um, that will be an online session, so there's no worry about traveling in February, um, and registration for that is open on L2. And we really encourage people to participate. One thing about the Roadside Training Series is that does come with a price tag, because what the group that, the group of library directors, and Amy's one of them, um, who, and Esther Curry's online as well, um, what this group wants to do is, is develop a, a pool of money um, that they can use to kind of move continuing education forward. So each of these series does come with, with a little price tag, but based on our first experience with um, training for library services that support homeless populations, it's going to be a good day. So think, think about that. The other one we're really trying to promote for our membership is on March 9th, and that's ILA's trustee workshop um, that will be right here in the State Library. I know all of you that are participating in this meeting have absolutely perfect boards. No troubles <laughs> ever. But sometimes that's not the case. And so just based on um, what we see being out and talking to all of you, we know that trustee training is a real necessity and it's really important. So please consider sending trustees um, to this workshop. The other thing is, and this is, this is a real political statement on my part, um, ILA for a long time did do two trustee trainings every year, one in the suburbs and one in the Springfield Champaign area. They stopped doing that several years ago and this is the first time they reintroduced it. So we really hope that we can get enough attendance there to support the continuation of an annual trustee training event in our part in the central part of the state. So anything any of you can do to help us um, make that a successful event would be great. The ILA Youth Services Institute is in Bloomington and that will be uh, March 21st and 22nd. On this document I also have continuing members matter meetings, all those kinds of things. Um, but then we jump down to April where ILA will again um, provide training for Illinois library leaders, it part of the Elevate series, and that will be here at the State Library on April 27th. This is an application process, so it's something to think about, and I believe the application deadline is March 1st. So that's something you might want to consider, um, again, taking advantage of. Director Zhu will be the first week in June, right? Again, we're gonna be at the State Library a lot, I guess. Um, <laughs> we'll be at the State Library the first week in June. Um, and that's something, if, if you are a new director or know a new director, encourage them to participate. participate. The learning and the networking opportunities there are just beyond measure. You, you just can't beat it. Um, this, Room and board is provided for this event, so I believe the registration is going to be about $125. If $150, okay, sorry, $150. Um, but for a week long, for a week of continuing education, your meals and a, a, a private hotel room um, that's a really good deal. And IHLS is pretty blessed to have a very generous director. And so Leslie has always made the offer that if a library struggles with that funding amount, we're there to provide support. So don't ever let the financial piece of that hold you back. Um, I've included on this document the dates for the upcoming ILA conference in the fall, the school library conference in the fall, and also two conferences that just tickle our fancies when we think about them. Um, what is the Association for Rural and Small Libraries Conference that will be held in September in Burlington, Vermont? And then um, also the Public Library Association Conference that will be held a year from now in Nashville, Tennessee. So just, you know, just things to keep on your radar. Um, have I missed talking about anything upcoming that's of import? The other thing I, I can tell you, and, and um, my friends from the State Library are certainly well aware of it, we're one month into the three-month certification process in which all of you need to do your interlibrary loan traffic surveys and fill out um, the online certification for our membership. 
It's a very simple process. We're over halfway done, which is, which is great news. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is, um, once the first month has passed, that means Anna and I get into nagging mode. So <laughs> to avoid the nagging, um, just take a minute and get that done. And Anna and I will be happy to answer any questions anybody has about those. Anna's taking charge of the public libraries and the academics, and I'm working with the schools and the specials. So anybody who has a question, reach out to either of us, and we're happy to help you, Susan. Um, Ellen, as you were speaking, and I don't know that you hit on this, that the ARSL, the, um, well, and that also, uh, but the Rural Small Library Conference, there's also, is it February 22nd? There's an online oh, yeah. yes, uh, that's conference right. that is a webinar that is, I believe, free to register. Right. We're having viewings, is that the right word? We said parties. parties. <laughs> you mean led me down another road, so it's a party. Um, <laughs> at our at our hubs to, to join with others kind of a networking opportunity so that um, we can view the conference together there'll be some discussion that can be led afterwards at each of our hubs on February 22nd and one thing when I looked at Susan I realized I had missed it um, reaching forward south <laughs> will be held on May 17th at SIUE at, at SIUC in Carbondale so those of us who work in the Carbondale office will be happy to have lots of colleagues come down to our neck of the woods. And again, all these dates with hyperlinks are on the event description on L2. Any questions about anything? Certification, upcoming good things. I just want to add to one more thing. Roadside training is also going to be available for viewing parties at our hub as well, our various hubs. So you can watch it either from your library and you can invite your trustees to watch it with you or you can all come to one of our hubs and watch it together. We're all for togetherness this month. <laughs> we'll stay warm. Yeah. Ellen? Yes. I just wanted to, to let you know, Holly from Brighton said, Director University, so helpful for newbies. Good. Good. And I think the, the organizers of that event hear that very frequently, and it, it's good feedback. Thanks, Holly. Okay, next on the agenda is SHARE. So, Cassandra, if you'd like to talk about what's going on with SHARE. Absolutely. Well, we have a very big project coming up the first weekend in March. That'll be at Saturday, March 2nd. We are actually going to do an upgrade to 6.2. And so we will be sending out uh, some information about some of the new features for the SHARE upgrade for those of you that are SHARE members. And so with that, uh, this, this upgrade, we're going to try something a little bit different. We're going to do a Zoom meeting. You know, so through some of the features live, we'll take in questions and then we'll um, do some work on our end and then send it out to the group after the fact, after we get some of those questions. And so that'll be on February 28th at 2 p.m. <clears throat> and it is in L2 if you'd like to register for that. Now that is not to be co confused with the following upgrade. I know some of you have reached out regarding the jet pay integration. That is under development and it will be ready for the 6.3 upgrade. So it's not quite ready yet, um, but we will be seeing that. So we'll get upgraded to that 6.2 and as soon as the jet pay integration is ready, we will do another uh, upgrade to make sure that your things are working properly. If Cassandra? Yes. You're a little quiet on the VTEL. I don't know if you need to be just a little closer to the mic. Um, yeah, I can do that. Sorry. Thank you. Sure. Okay, is that a little bit better? Oh, yes. Okay. Well, I was just saying that, and it could be that I apologize. I'm uh, getting over a bit of a sinus issue, so I apologize. My voice is a little wonky today. Um, so we are doing a, a, an upgrade to Polaris for those of you that are our SHARE members. And so that will be the weekend of March 2nd. It'll be an overnight upgrade, so hopefully you won't see any disruption to service. Um, and as part of that, we'll be doing a 
uh, uh, Zoom feature with Joanne and Troy and Shelly to go over some of the new features for Share um, with that upgrade. So we'll do, be doing it in real time, showing you some of the new um, new screens and what it's look what it looks like. And from there, um, we'll take in questions and then respond to the group after the meeting. And so that will be the um, preview will be on February 28th at 2 p.m. And so that is an L2 if you'd like to register for that event. So as, um, as part of that, we are also uh, going to be doing a following upgrade for our JetPay integration. So some of you might have might have already started switching over for the JetPay um, through your local governments. And if you are, uh, please know that we are in development with Polaris to make that feature available. If you have switched over and you need your links changed for um, your OPAC, if your link is to pay is through your OPAC, um, please let us know. We can just disable that and take it out temporarily. We know some people are actually putting that on their websites instead, and so that might be an option just as a temporary stopgap measure. Um, so again, once we'll get we'll get upgraded to the 6.2, and then as soon as that um, feature is available for the JetPay vendor in 6.3, we'll get that upgraded just as soon as it's ready. Yeah, Cassandra. Uh huh. Um, Bobby is asking, will the share demo be recorded? Uh, <laughs> she won't be able to have all of her CERC staff watch it live. Yes, absolutely. We will uh, record it and then send it out to the group. So another um, exciting thing that's going on with share is our um, book clubs. We're trying to coordinate book club and resource sharing, uh, or book club and kit resource sharing. And so the way I envision this working is that each of our libraries can choose to purchase a book club kit and so it would live at your library you would determine the title but you'd make it available to all of the share membership and so that way let's say that rick has a book club kit that he would be willing to loan and that amy would like to request and so she would borrow that kit as a whole and let's say it would have you know, for example, 10 copies of the book, two large print titles, the copy of the audiobook, and then Rick had actually contacted us to let us know that we could, um, to see if we could order it through the cloud library. So we have all different formats, it all comes together, and we're considering purchasing software that it can be tracked and reserved. So instead of placing a hold um, on 10 different copies, then you can place a hold on the kit through that software and you'd have it for the time, the amount of time that you need it. So for example, if you have a monthly book club, you'd have it for six weeks in order to get the materials, to get them checked out, to get them returned and then back to the owning library. And so we're really excited about that because I know um, a lot of times where we have trouble with um, libraries keeping things or changing due dates, it's almost always due to those book clubs. And so we really think that this is going to be a very popular program once we get it off the ground. So we're uh, forming a group to go through some of the odds and ends of, of making it work for our consortium. And so we're actually doing that on the 7th. So that'll be on Thursday. So if anybody's interested or wants to sit in on that, just uh, reach out to me and I'd be happy to send you the link. And so, like I said, we're really excited. So keep an eye out. We'll have a lot more information once we get some of these uh, processes in place. Okay. Thank you. Do you think maybe Joanne or Shelly has anything? Uh, Joe, I don't. Okay. Yeah. Um, are they here? Yeah, they're, they're online. Joanne or Shelly, do you have anything? I don't have anything. Thank you. Thanks. I'm good, but thank you. Any, <clears throat> any questions for Cassandra? I don't see any online. <coughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Susan, work it out. If you'd like to talk about delivery. I don't know that I can follow Cassandra. We don't have as much exciting, <laughs> fun stuff. You're gonna be delivering the book club kids. Um, yes, yes. <laughs> you'll include us in the discussion, which is fabulous. Um, you know, to make sure that they make it through delivery good or well, or anyway. 
it'll get to you guys in one piece and all the parts. And um, so basically, I, I'm trying not to jinx anything, but we are going to have a delivery survey coming out. Um, that's usually around this time. So we get the feedback, we get some more ideas to generate that we can change or modify delivery or, you know, just get that feedback. Um, we do super appreciate that. And, and you guys have been great with your honesty. I mean, I think if we, if you didn't tell us there was a problem, you know what I'm going to think? There's no problem. And so it's good when you see things differently. Uh, I also wanted to thank everyone for bearing with us through your own tundra experiences or the Arctic or whatever you want to call it. Uh, the guys, they've been um, really trying to, to keep on top of things. And, and as always, they have the ability to come back if it does get too bad out there. Um, a lot of them are pretty much like, oh, we should have ran. And I'm like, no. You know, yes. Wasn't it five minutes outside and you got frostbite at <laughs> negative 50? Um, so anyway, so I just wanted to thank everybody. Uh, and uh, as far as uh, things are going, I feel like they're going well. And uh, I don't know, does anyone have any questions? I can't believe this is all I have to say. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, I got one other thing. Eli Mina, okay, I attended uh, 101 boardroom problems and how to solve them. Uh, I attended a session with this fellow. <laughs> amazing. Absolutely amazing. Oh, and guide to minute taking if anybody wants to know how to take minutes. Um, the thing is, is that it was offered by ALA and it was on trustee. And he's just, he puts things in practical terms. He has cute little stories to help you remember why the practical things matter. And it was amazing um, to speak to somebody who like goes to a conference for Robert's Rules of Order. Like there's a huge conference. It's in Las Vegas. Anyway, he says it takes so long. Yeah. 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 But you know, he talks about um, how when they start their meeting that it takes like literally forever just to get they may have just two agenda items and it's like an eight hour meeting, you know, because they get so particular. But he says in everyday use, that's not what Robert's Rules of Order was meant for. It was to, to, to put some common sense and some rules so that your meeting can be effective and move on. Um, they had, you know, he, he started out with saying suffering is optional. And so then immediately I liked him because I'm like, wow, that's a good, good thing. You're power, empowered. Um, I took notes. I don't have to share the notes. <laughs> I Susan, notes. <laughs> Susan, could you turn the book towards the, the camera? camera? Well, actually, I don't know where the Oh, OK, right there. And oh, my gosh. <laughs> hi. <laughs> and you're covering up the author. Eli oh. Mina. His name is E-L-I. M-I-N-A. He's actually out of Vancouver, which is just two hours north of Seattle. Who because knew? you were at? I was at ALA Midwinter in Seattle, Washington. Um, I got to see, I got to attend this session, which was well worth everything. It was amazing. Um, and I also visited the Seattle Public Library, which, I don't know, yeah, well, yeah, we all have different views. You know, uh, one of the areas that you walk through at that library is completely red, like shiny vinyl red. So you feel like red rum, red rum. Mm. If anybody knows the shining, you know, when you're going through and I'm like, oh my goodness. But it was a, a really great experience. And that was just one of the sessions that I attended that really had an impact. And here's a really quick, quick, small story. Our, sh our bus shuttle driver, was actually born in Peoria. His father was born in St. Louis. And um, as well as I also had, I mean, it's just such a small world in the library world. And I also was able to meet um, Innovation, the company that has Polaris now? Innovative. Innovative, mm -hmm. innovative. I actually shared a cab ride because the cab was so expensive, I felt. Uh, going from the airport. So then when I was checking out, I heard this lady talking and she's going to the airport. So I said, 
hey, would you want to share a ride? She ended up paying for it. She's from Innovative. She's on their research team. Her name's Catherine. I have a card somewhere. Um, but she was amazed. She hadn't really heard of Polaris. I mean, she heard of Polaris, obviously, but us. So, of course, I shared about us. Largest consortium in North America, just saying, 362 members, 486 buildings, connections. Um, so who knows where that'll go, because I'll contact her again to thank her again, because she ended up paying for her cab ride, so fabulous. So, do you want to talk about what, what you were there for? Oh, your committee. yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was there. See, I have things. Oh, I'm so excited. So I was there because I'm co-chair of the ASPLA um, Physical Delivery Interest Group, which is part of ALA, and it stands for the, um, oh my goodness. Association. Association of Specialized Governmental Library. There's a C word. Russia. Library Association. Something like that. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I don't know yeah, that after You have to drive on the way out. <laughs> well, I was also up at two. Wouldn't that be just like, you know, funny? <laughs> Anyhow, so um, in that committee, what that committee is, and I welcome anyone who is curious about and is a member of ALA, please come to our, our meetings. And, and we have them online twice a year. We have them in person. Um, and what the Physical Interest Delivery Group does, it's nationwide. And the really cool thing is it's about people who are interested in delivery, whether it's outsourced or in-house or how things are done and we're really trying to make it more interactive instead of just introductions you know and everybody's like oh okay um we put some um i put on the agenda this wonderful idea that north of seattle in fact um amazon is now using like a little i think of it as like a roomba on steroids that will go on the sidewalks for delivery but and is that a reality for us here? No, but you have to keep always looking, looking to see what part you could maybe take on. Drones are now up to five pounds. Uh, Metropolis, you do too, much, too many things if you're on with us that I can't, you know, you're over five pounds. But that might be a, a thing down the road. You don't know, just to keep open with ideas. So I would, uh, I would love to have people join our group and help with the discussion. You guys would have different things to, that, you know, interest you with the delivery. Uh, you could give different feedback and stuff. Um, I, of course, have shared the Illinois model. I know, I know, I know I drone on this. And, I'm, I, and I've now learned to recognize the uh, people whose eyes are rolling back in their head. So I cut my speech down to like three minutes. But Illinois does this really, really well. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, so it doesn't really matter in that sense. But if we all just talk about what Illinois does really well, we can start a whole movement with these libraries. I mean, you know, I have a movement with libraries, but a lot of times they don't even realize that they can go into their library and borrow something that's not on the shelves and that is delivered. And Secretary of State Jesse White, yay! So there's no cost directly to the library. Other states, they're having to pay for these things themselves, they're using the post office system, they're using OC and nothing against OCLC. So but they're having to use OCLC to find the items to borrow. We are really in a rich resource sharing area state of Illinois. So kudos <laughs> to everybody. Yep. Hey, I know you have to cut me off. And nobody no. has to me at all. <laughs> Any questions for Susan, Julia? <clears throat> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Leslie, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Uh, good morning again, and thank you for um, elevating um, Cher and in the minds of others, and shame on that person that works at Innovative yeah. for not knowing about Cher. Yes. And, and you're not the only one of us that's encountered that, so uh, there, there's my um, stump speech for today. Um, and, and again, thank you for representing <laughs> the value of delivery, because that's a big deal, and for taking on that responsibility um, on our behalf. So, so the couple things I'd like to share from you with you from the system perspective. Can you hear me, Julia? Good. Yes, we can. Yes, I'm projecting. Um, so, a couple things that are going on at the um, from the system level. First of all, we're happy to announce that we will be uh, offering um, a design thinking workshop. Uh, yet in this fiscal year, we've been alluding to it and um, 
Um, it is included in this year's budget, and by golly, we're going to be able to present that. It looks like it'll be um, mid to late June, and we have two sessions of this planned. Um, there'll be it's a one day um, workshop. It's presented by trainers from Chicago Public Library. And two of our staff, Susan is one of them, so if you're in this room with us today, you can ask her after our session or here today um, what she found useful, what she thought about the um, experience. Um, and, uh, and they're apparently like an eight-hour eight session. Um, we're going to hold them in our Evansville office due to the traveling constraints of the two trainers that come from uh, Chicago Public. So it'll be one day and then a second day. So we'll have two different sessions. They are available to our staff and they are also available to anyone else in the state that any other library staff that want to attend. There is a fee, however, we've not quite worked that out. We'll do our best to keep that low. Um, we will, um, all the materials will be provided, lunch will be provided, also snacks, because nobody learns when they're hungry or um, cranky, cranky or hangry. So, um, so we'll, you know, all of that will be included, but I do encourage people when they see the announcements to start thinking about it and um, consider maybe sending someone from your staff or a couple or signing themselves up. So um, look for that. We, we hope to be able to make an announcement um, in the next few weeks. Uh, second of all, um, we're looking, we're doing a lot of looking back so that we can look forward. So, and move forward. So um, this is the time of uh, calendar year. Well, in January, now we're in February. Boy, that went by fast. January is like, um, the older I get, the faster it goes. It's what my parents always tell me. Um, anyway, so we've looked back at our accomplishments for uh, the first half of the fiscal year, and that's informing our decisions as we go throughout the rest of the fiscal year, and that also helps us determine where we want to be um, where we, what we're looking at for fiscal year 2020, because that that time where we put together our application for our system area for capital grant is just around the corner, and we're waiting anxiously for our, from our friends at the state library to tell us when those applications are due and just what they're going to say. Three weeks from now. <laughs> 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 no rush, no worries. It's not like we don't do these every year. So, um, but seriously, the two primary components in that are our budget and um, our operational plan. So, because I love budgeting and our finance department loves budgeting, so we've already started talking about that and, and started looking at um, budget numbers already. So, um, the sooner we start, the better it is for everybody and um, the better we all understand where we are. So that's one of the things um, we're engaged in. Another is um, during the last, the previous fiscal year, right, I think, we um, did quite a bit of renovation. Um, well, touch up, I, maybe not. Uh, uh, on the exterior of the Champagne building, we, we worked on, we had the, uh, the entire driveway replaced, which made a big difference because there were potholes where you could lose an entire family. They were so big, and like if you had, honestly, if you had a small car, I don't know how you could have avoided part of your car not going through or into one of those. Um, so that was redone. We had our drive the the ramp redone to the garage. That was um, a major expense, and plus the interior was um, all cleaned up and all renewed, refreshed. Um, there are two areas in that building that have not yet been done. That's on our list for completion either this fiscal year or early next fiscal year. Then uh, the other building that we own is the Eversville building. We're working with a, a planning, a space planner uh, to consider what we might do with that space to modify it so that it fits for how the space is being used now, contemporarily, and what we might be doing in the, in the future. So that's a slightly bigger project. It's a two-story building, not a one-story building. And um, that's a process that will obviously involve our budget in the next few years as we, as we look forward. Um, and then finally, I'm happy to say that we're, we're looking forward to um, filling some of our open positions. We have a marketing coordinator position um, that we hope to be filling soon, as well as a cataloging position, a circulation specialist, 
position and a metadata um, catalog of positions. So it'll be nice to have more staff on board and um, we can look forward to um, um, getting more um, tasks accomplished. Does anybody have any questions for me? Not any online. All righty. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, next on our agenda is an update from the State Library. Greg, you want to sit here? Wherever you are. Maybe up by the camera. Okay. Maybe you can see by the camera. Yeah. <laughs> well, good morning, and um, first and foremost, greetings from Secretary of State Jesse White, of course, the State Librarian. Um, we're very happy that he remains our State Librarian since we've uh, last met. So. Uh, just a few quick updates for me and, and maybe some information. Um, the State Library is currently in the process of reviewing the Public Library per capita grant applications. We received 630 this year. I know that for most of the attendees um, did file those applications. Ten libraries did not. Um, we're as much interested in why they may not have as um, that because that's just kind of money that uh, we feel is very important to the public library community. We do anticipate that our budget is going to support those at the full statutory funding within this fiscal year. Um, so we're anxious to finalize those review and get those award letters out. Um, we also received um, a large sum, so there's a lot of interest in public library construction again, of um, applications, 24 applications requesting $1.4 million um, for fiscal year 19. I will say the appropriation is not <laughs> sufficient to support that, so our review committee will have some work to do with those. And there is priority that's already established in administrative rule for funding those applications. Um, Project Next Generation grant applications, I know that's um, some of the libraries that are represented here today are Project Next Generation sites. Rita Stevens is joining us. Those applications are due March 15. Um, we're also anxious um, to see those, review those, and get those awarded. The literacy grant applications for adult, family, and workplace literacy um, applications and awards for FY20 were due yesterday. Um, I do not have the count this morning of how many we received. Um, we did have, uh, again, more interest this year. Um, our staff was working diligently um, with literacy providers, libraries specifically. We're trying to gather, gain more interest in, within the library community of providing those services. Um, so we will see where um, we are with those in, in the coming days and weeks. Um, what are we doing right now? Well, this, of course, is budget time. Um, Tron can relate to that as representing a state agency library, too. And as we um, work with the academic community, we're waiting on the um, budget address from the governor's office. Of course, the secretary's budget, um, as it is introduced or stands right now, is still very supportive of library funding and keeping it level at this point and that, that is certainly our hope as we are in the very early stages of that process for FY20. Um, we're also following and I was on a call this morning with the chair of the Illinois Library Association's Public Policy Committee. Um, I know that Heartland has representatives on that committee. Um, I think it's important that all libraries are aware of you know, some of the possible legislation, that you are interacting with those representatives from Heartland. And honestly, we know that many of those members are from the Northern Library System, but the things that are being discussed impact everyone in the state. And it's very important that the libraries um, throughout Illinois are following what is going on and some considerations. There, 
is some legislation and a big issue right now um, is the minimum wage issue, um, which of course, um, in theory and philosophy, it's a wonderful, wonderful idea. It impacts the library budgets. That's been two discussions now with the Illinois Library Association, um, the executive committee, and will be discussed again tomorrow with public policy. Um, there are, um, have been some bills introduced regarding um, municipal trustees um, and changes to from appointment in cities, um, or if you are a village in the commission forum, to um, a possible election, which would be a big change in public library law. Um, there is a bill that is will be heavily discussed by the Public Policy Committee also regarding the amount of funding that can be accumulated within the treasury of a public library, um, generally specifically toward a capital project or a building project. Um, it would set a cap for that. The school funding bill that was implemented also had a cap in the funding that a school district could accumulate. Um, so that too will be discussed tomorrow is of great interest. Um, and essentially some libraries have been able to avoid um, going to referenda again, or um, maybe didn't even get approval um, the referendum for construction, but they've been able to accumulate money. And this is um, addressing that issue in the state. That doesn't impact all libraries by any means. Um, but it, it may become a big, big issue. Um, so I, I urge everyone to um, be aware of that. Whether you're um, an Illinois Library Association member or not, most of the libraries are institutional members at the least and should be following what's going on. Um, so I would encourage that. Um, Ellen asked that I speak briefly, I think, about um, Kentucky Book and Braille service, what we're doing at the State Library. Um, several years ago, that was fully consolidated here um, at the State Library. The Heartland Library System was the machine lending agency for many, many years, reaching across the Illinois Library System had um, what we refer to now as the call center for people across the state. Chicago Public Library also um, had an operation, um, more specific, I would say, to residents of, of Chicago um, with statewide services than responsibility of the regional library systems. It was consolidated here at the State Library. We have additional staff um, that we've employed, and this has been quite successful thus far, I think. Um, we have our own call center, all machines. We're awaiting to the change now um, of the digital format of the books, um, actually more of a download, and we will be creating um, the books for patrons as the requests come in versus having uh, digital tapes or cassettes wow. in the collection. So it will be more of a duplication on demand type service. Um, that will have staffing implications. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that will be a change nationwide um, that will be dictated by National Library Service. So how does that integrate with the libraries? Well, one, um, and we've discussed this at the State Library for quite some time. The patrons that are eligible for this, we're really not close to where we should be. Um, honestly, we could be serving 10 times the number that we do. Um, if you look at the statistics on who should be eligible for this service, and ultimately, most of us in this room are going to become eligible for this <laughs> service. Yeah. Um, so it's really an awareness at um, the public library level that this does exist and directing people to the state library to get the applications. Um, there is 
a certification that often requires um, a physician to sign off on regarding the eligibility. Now, that being said, we're still circulating over 2,500 books a day um, out of here. So it's a large operation <laughs> as it sits, but we still need to do much more in the way of outreach or reaching them. Um, and we've often found too that it's not the patron themselves who is going to fill out an application. It's going to be a family member um, that is going to direct them to a service. So we're very interested in that. I would hope that you know everyone that is participating today in person or um, through the Zoom video conferencing service um, keeps that in mind. And I say public libraries, but truly it's for school libraries, any academic library where you may come across someone who would be, or you feel would be eligible to this service. So we're very, very interested in seeing the service grow. Thanks, Greg. Questions? I have two questions. When considering the construction grants, does the review committee look to represent the Illinois library landscape geographically? Well, I think as, as best possible, certainly, but that is not an absolute criteria. The criteria falls within the categories of the grants. Is it a grant regarding accessibility um, which has a higher level maybe than renovation. There's a certain amount of money that is set aside too for the mini <coughs> category where there's no applications. Now, that being said, if all of the applications in a particular category come from one area of the state, there's no way for us to address that. So truly, they're looking at the criteria that are established in administrative rule and also looking at how good the application itself is. Is everything in order? Is the library ready? Is the match, if it's required, clearly documented? Okay. Uh, the next question is, also, what is the bill in terms of caps on the dollars that can be held and what is the bill number? I might have that with me. I have it upstairs. And I do not, I'm sorry. I can get that um, and I can email it to Heartland and you can share it back with this group. And, and one thing to add to that too is um, the public policy committee meetings are available via VTEL tomorrow morning at both our Edwardsville office and our Carbondale office. So anybody who's interested would be more than welcome to come and sit in. So we'll be Okay, and Greg, Diane wanted to say that uh, they just helped a mom sign up her blind daughter. Both are so happy to have a service they did not know about until now. Wonderful, and thank you, Diane. Anything else for Greg? I don't see anything else. Thanks, Greg. That's a big, go ahead. So I, I'm going to ask that we make one movement on the agenda. Sure. Mary Reisling. <laughs> I don't wait. <laughs> 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 Who um, is from the secretary's <laughs> program staff. Um, she is a long time member of state government. Just uh, like you. Just like me, <laughs> just like me. <laughs> We've been here forever. <laughs> um, and she is um, a representative to the Complete Count Commission. Joan, uh, and I don't know what your official title is, but that I'll let you introduce it. I pretty much answered today. Okay, <laughs> so Joan Natale from the State Library is working um, as our representative to this group, and they're going to speak to you more about 
the upcoming census, the role libraries may play, the role that libraries are probably going to have to play in the upcoming census. So, welcome and thank you. Thank you, Director. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm going to have Mary is really the lead staff person for the Complete Count Commission, and um, she's going to give an overview of, of what the commission does, and then I'm going to talk some about what the libraries, what we're looking for them to do, and some of our activities. First off, thank you for having me here today, and also for making time for this very important um, project that's going to be coming up in 2020. So the Secretary of State's office by statute is the chair of the Illinois Complete Count Commission for the 2020 Census. Um, it's 22 members. It was formed. We started having meetings last year. We have monthly meetings um, currently. There are members from um, the four caucuses and from other state institutions as well as organizations that, that represent um, communities throughout the state of Illinois. So we started meeting last year back in March and basically I mean the mission of the commission, mission of the commission, <laughs> uh, is to make sure that every Illinois resident is counted in the 2020 census. Um, there is thought that we were historically undercounted in 2010 there are serious concerns that we will lose at least one and possibly two congressional seats because of population shifts and movement out of the state um, since 2010. And because of that, and because of the undercount in 2010, we want to make sure that we get everybody counted. And there's a lot of struggles that are going to occur in 2020 because of it. Um, we have a huge um, immigrant population that is terrified to share information with the federal government at this point in time. So, you know, we have to educate them and encourage them to be able to, you know, so that they come out and get counted just like everybody else. Um, we also have issues, I mean, in the Harvey Count populations, that's, which is the areas that we're gonna focus on um, quite a bit for 2020, is gonna be the immigrant population, your rural populations, um, the, the homeless, veterans, things like that, groups that are historically undercounted or considered hard to count. And so those are the organizations that are the groups that we, that we wanna work with. So we wanna, we're gonna focus, um, focus towards that effort to make sure all those individuals specifically are counted in addition to everyone else. The commission has formed six subcommittees since we started. We have a state and local government subcommittee. We have a business subcommittee. We have social services education, media, social media, and the Hard to Count Committee. And there are members of the commission that are on each of these subcommittees, but the chairs of those subcommittees are focusing on getting their fingers out into the local communities and bringing in more people to get them also involved from, from specific areas. So where does the library fit into this? That's the, the long version, I'll get to, to why we're here today. The library has, has historically been very important to the community and is gonna be extremely important to us in 2020. The Census Bureau is going to use the internet and technology in 2020 to do the count. They're gonna use that primarily. They will still do door to door and phone calls and things like that that they've done in the past, but they really want to rely on technology this year. So there's gonna be an internet capability to do the count. Obviously, we have a lot of communities and a lot of households that do not have internet in the house um, for a wide variety of reasons. Or we have um, individuals that you know just don't have computer skills, like our older population, some of, some of our older population. So we want to look to the libraries to help us with these individuals. Um, you know, we want to do outreach within the libraries themselves you know, put up information and make the librarians knowledgeable about what's going on so they can, they can encourage participation. And also, if somebody would come into the library and need internet service so that they can complete their, their questionnaire, um, you know, we are encouraging the local libraries to allow that. 
even if the member is not, even if the individual is not necessarily necessarily a member of the library, um, because regardless of whether they're a member of the library or not, if they are not counted in your community, then it's going to impact the libraries because it's all about funding. So we have um, brochures <coughs> available right now, informational brochures that you can get out to anybody that wants them. They can contact Joe and he can get the information to me and we can get them out. The brochures are currently in English only, but we are getting them translated into French, Spanish, Hindi, Chinese, and Polish for our communities within, within the state. Um, hopefully we will have some money somewhere along the way to get those printed up as well, but we'll at least make them available online. We do have a census website, which is IllinoisCensus2020.com. It has um, information about what the commission's been doing. Um, there's minutes from our past meetings, but the brochures are on there. There's all kinds of, um, there's lots of information on there. There's connections to the U.S. Census Bureau and reports and things like that that, that you might find interesting and might, might want to look at. So, um, in addition, we are also encouraging communities to um, put together local complete count committees. So it's like the complete count commission, but it's done specifically on the local level. Um, you don't need to have the permission of the commission to form something. Usually they're formed with, within a gov with using a governmental entity within your community. So like a mayor, a village president, something like that, but it doesn't have to be. If you, if your city government doesn't have anything formed, groups of people can come together and form their own little complete count committees and you know, to help do the education and encouragement. We, we, they register with the Census Bureau. We get information out of it so that they can work within the local communities um, for all the different populations that they have. So we have also done, um, in November, the, one of the things that the commission had to do was file an interim report with the General Assembly on what the commission has done to date, what we plan on doing in 1920. That interim report is available on the, the website. So you can go through there and read that. There's lots of attachments to it as well for supporting documentation on, on what the commission is asking for. So one of which is funding. Because um, while they created the commission, they gave us some money. So the Secretary of State's office has been pretty much supporting the operations of the commission since we started working. Um, the library has been a huge, huge help to us in that regard, uh, particularly with the outreach efforts. And then like our communication staff and things like that have been working to, to print up all the documentation and, uh, and all the brochures and things that are going out. So I will stop talking and let Joe go at this point. So. Yeah, I, I really think the libraries have done more than any other group yes. so far promoting the census. Yes. The flyers we did send out to libraries um, a while back. I, think, um, I guess we can get more if you need more, but uh, just let me know. One activity we have coming up, the commission asked the libraries if we would run a post, the library, if we would run a poster contest to the library. It's the Secretary of State's have done with other groups, they've done the organ donor and the uh, school bus safety. So we're doing one, um, and we're, we're getting the flyers together that we expect to get out by around mid-March, that we would make copies and send you to the public libraries to have available, Then we might have 10 per library. If you need more, you can make, it, make copies, or um, we'll also have them on the census website. Or, um, we'll accept posters from, they'll, they'll send them here to the State Library from May 1st through June 17th. There's going to be three categories, um, grades, grades, four through six, seven through nine, and 10 through 12. So we're, we're we think we're hitting kids in civics class, history, um, graphic arts. We want them to incorporate the, the, I guess the brand is Census 2020, make sure Illinois counts. We want them to use that in the poster. We want them to use the logo. They can also add some, um, you know, text about 
um, the positive aspects of the census that it, it helps with road construction, infrastructure repairs, school and libraries, health services, services to the disabled and veterans, <coughs> and uh, you know, help the local economy. The posters can be in, in English, Spanish, Polish, Hindu, French, or Chinese. So, uh, if the other language besides English, we're going to need on the form. We ask them to give us a translation. Um, there'll be like three winners in each category, but then there'll be one overall winner, which we expect that poster will be duplicated and distributed throughout the state. And then with the other posters. We'd like to do exhibits here in Chicago or around the state so then people can see what the kids have done. Um, Mary mentioned about the, the, the census is online. So people will be coming in the library. And I know after I've been here a little longer than Greg. <laughs> so, you know. Um, <laughs> Between the three of us, we got a lot of years. It's a century. Yes, I'm pretty close. <laughs> Non-resident, my head explodes. <laughs> <laughs> but when we are asked, as I'm sure every librarian does, <laughs> yeah, you know, we want libraries to be welcoming, you know, to the non-resident, to the Hispanic population. You know, people are afraid, um, and I think with the, this would be a good, you know, a sort of good PR on our part to you know come in do the census, um, and I know there'll have to be some work with the, the terminals, there'll have to be some work around that'll have to be discussed, but um, you know, that's what, I know it's a big ask, but we're, but we're asking. Um, ILA, we're gonna do a presentation. Uh, we spoke to ILA a couple of weeks ago. I think their interest is on a presentation is if a, per, if a person comes in the library to do the census, how do we help? What, is there a script or there's something we should do? Um, so we'll, we'll submit a proposal. Also on May 17th, I'll be at that um, Reaching Forward South Conference and providing an update on the census and, and where we're at. So if there's any questions. <coughs> I have some questions. Okay. Uh, first of all, with the census form, can people access it from their smartphones? I, I believe I, I the way that the census is setting it up, I don't know for sure that there's going to be an app, but the way that they're utilizing <laughs> technology for this for you know for 2020, I cannot imagine there would not be an app. Because I think most people, regardless of how poor, how wealthy, mm -hmm. and a lot of people just can't afford baby formula, they have mm -hmm. a smartphone. Mm -hmm. So, and that's the way they access most of their information. Mm -hmm. So that's that question. And then the other question is, um, oh, let me see if I can remember what my other question was. Um, also, we have large pockets of poverty mm -hmm. and transient population. Mm -hmm. How much should libraries be concerned that people might be double counted, not counted at all? How active should we be in trying to pursue these people? Well, I wouldn't, we're not looking to the libraries to necessarily pursue them. Good. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, yeah. or police them. Yeah, or, or police them. Yes. Um, what we're just asking you to be is an ambassador. So if someone comes in and wants to utilize the services within the library for completion of the questionnaire, that, you know, we just want you to be ambassadors and a conduit for that. We, we don't want you to have to go, you know, chase down, chase down people to say, have you completed the census? The Census Bureau will hire people for that. Um, that's, and they, they've walked us through the, the technology that they're using and, and they are like so tech savvy. They're going to be able to know when people complete the questionnaires and they'll be able to know like what household has not. I mean, they'll be able to get down to specific households and specific apartment buildings. Um, and know who has not, and they will then pursue them on foot. So, but that will be the, enumer the enumerator's um, job to do, not, not the library. We're just asking you guys to, you know, be ambassadors, so. We, we think the big issue maybe in some libraries, it's easy to sit here and think, oh, sure you go to a library, do that. Not every library policy 
is going to allow just anyone to walk in and use the computer to do this. And so during this time, we're really requesting libraries, library boards, relax that policy. Yes, yeah, ultimately, yeah. they have to understand yeah. Yeah. what's at risk here. And, and the, the census rolls out on April 1st of 2020. Yeah, April 1st, 2020 um, is when the census will roll out. So, and that's, that's when the initial outreach will start from there. Um, and so that's when you're probably, you know, I would say over the summer months and, and into early fall is when you might see a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, but when you might see people coming into your libraries and requesting the census for completion of the questionnaire. Um, do they have an estimate of how long it takes to complete the questionnaire yet? There, no. The short answer is no. There is um, a there's a short questionnaire and then there's a long questionnaire. Some people get picked for the short. Some people get picked for the long. I don't know what the you know how they determine that. I remember in 2010 I had to do the short one. Um, so the, the big question or the big issue with the questionnaire is. Right now, there is a question with regard to citizenship on the census. And it may be on there come April 1st of 2020, and it may not be on there. We just don't know. They're fighting in the courts right now. Um, we are operating under the assumption that it will be. So that way we can like you know push the education efforts so and try and not make people afraid of that. Um, and there are also I mean, there's there's going to be there's going to be people that just don't want to answer that question in particular, but they can still complete the census and not necessarily answer that one individual question. So their their census questionnaire is not going to be thrown out because they don't answer one question. The the other information will be included in the count um, because there's there's other questions on the census questionnaire that people get you know a little nervous about when they start asking about household incomes or how many people are living in your household, things like that. So there's other questions that make people, questions that make people uneasy as well. But the citizenship question is the one that we're really going to have to uh, do the outreach on and make people not afraid because um, the Spanish population now outnumbers the African American population in San Omar. So if they are undercounted, we're in big trouble. And Illinois is one of the most friendliest states to immigrants and especially. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, regardless of what your political thoughts are on it, I mean, like, you know, Chicago is a sanctuary city and things like that. Um, yes, that it has, it has become a, uh, it's become very popular with the, Hispanic, with the Hispanic community. I mean, from, you know, living in the city of Chicago to job opportunities in Southern Illinois for migrant workers to work on farms. So it's like the jobs are here. So this is where they come. It's not just that population that's, that's fearful. There's, I can tell you that in rural Illinois, there's a lot of antipathy mm -hmm. to the census. At least there has been historically. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, there's just fear of the government in general. Right. So, where are you from in Southern mm -hmm. Uh Well, I grew up in Wind, Illinois. Not okay. necessarily Southern, but South Central. Okay. I grew up in a town a little bit more, larger than that, but not much. Murfreesboro. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. I said that South. Yes, yes. <laughs> People ask where it is, and I said, find Cairo and go an hour north. <laughs> you, you, you're just a little bit west of Carbondale. <laughs> just a little bit, just a little bit. So okay. but it's like a different world between Carbondale and Murphy's. Mm -hmm. I've got a county, though. Yes. Quick question. Um, the program you do for ILA, is that something that could be also captured in some kind of webinar or something so that people could access it? Or could it be at a live sure. presentation? Sure. Um, I've had some help, but I think yeah. that'd be really helpful for people. <laughs> yeah. Because that's the question they'll have. How, you can put that together with our communications. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And have it available for everyone who doesn't attend on it. That would be beneficial. Yeah, it would be really would be. Yeah. I have a comment and a question. Uh, Christy at the Glen Carbon Library, she said they're holding a census training at their library today. Oh, yay, yay. Yeah. So, and then the question, can you speak to any correlation in population drop in Illinois and the budget crisis we endured a couple years ago? 
Oh. Which budget crisis? <laughs> I, well, before I worked for Secretary of State, I did 10 years with the General Assembly, so please don't hold that against me. Um, I mean, I don't necessarily see a correlation to it. What I see with individuals leaving the state of Illinois doesn't necessarily have to do with the budget crisis that we had for two years, what two years without a budget. What a lot of people I think are leaving is because of taxation issues, whether it's a state, state taxes or local taxes, it's the cost of living in Illinois versus the cost of living in another state um, is, is what I see with a lot of people that are leaving. Okay, and on the budget, she said the one with zero budget forever. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think it was. Yeah, I don't think that. No, I mean, did that 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 affected more of the social service groups? That you know, we lost a lot of social service groups over those two years where we went without a budget, where they had to close their doors. Um, so that really affected the the more poverty stricken communities and groups. I think then the overall population in general. And, and the population numbers used pretty much were fixed from the 2010 census for both state and federal funding. So that didn't, I don't think that changed dramatically. The, the dramatic change came between, you know, with, after the 2010 census. I have a question just in general. How, I guess, how do we know that we were undercounted in 2010? We lost. Uh, we lost two congressional, one congressional seat for sure. Um, but the the thought was that there wasn't a lot of effort given in 2010, like what they're trying to do in 2020. Oh, okay. um, like what you're thinking. Yeah, okay. there was. I mean, there was no funding. There was everybody was just sort of left to their own devices to okay. try and get participation in 2010. There was not an organized effort. Okay. In 2010, so. The thought process is there was a lot of people that just were not reached or were not educated enough in, in you know, from the fear of government and things like that to participate. So, and then within the immigrant community, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of people who just, they don't want to be counted because they don't want people to know they're here. So. Any other questions in the room or online? Not any more online. I mean, now online we're viewing Anna's presentation. Yeah. Well, we still have time for questions. Oh, yeah, definitely. And yeah, we're really happy to be here. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And, and <laughs> this guy and that guy over there know how to get in touch with me. I didn't bring any business cards with me. So, but you know, I've got them on speed dial like they have me on speed dial. So if anybody has, if they think of anything after the meeting's over with, or if you have any follow-up questions or concerns, you know, don't hesitate to get in touch with me and I will try and help in any way I can. And again, appreciate you guys taking the time to put us on the agenda today. And uh, also appreciate all the help that you can give us in 21. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. All right. Thank you. Thank you. They're cookies, people. Grab some of your Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Okay. The next thing we have on our agenda is. Right, right at the beginning of January, Anna started to say to me, did you see, did you see, with new changes that are coming into effect for this, for this calendar year in Illinois Library Laws? So I asked her if she'd spend some time this morning um, talking to us about those changes. It's wonderful to have a colleague working in membership services. And um, just her ability to do this for us today will prove my point. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Ellen. You're That's welcome. very kind of you to say. Um, I think that I was starting out under one assumption with this presentation, and then it's kind, it kind of morphed into something else. Um, I have 
always been taught to teach people to fish instead of giving them the fish to eat. And so this kind of like looking forward where to go, what resources are available to you when you have questions about things. Um, also, I was going to talk about some various new legislation that I saw, um, but I have, I, you know, before I shared that with you, I wanted to check into it further. And so I'm going to have to wait a little bit to share those things with you. Um, so a little bit about me before we delve into this. I have had, um, I have a background. My undergraduate degree was in political science. I have uh, worked in government documents. I worked at a law firm, two different law firms. Um, I have kind of a background in these kind of things and an interest. And um, so I'm, I have a natural interest in these things. And I know that not everyone can keep on top of like the new laws and how the changes affect them. So I'm more than happy to do that. But um, <coughs> for some reason you need an answer and I'm not there. I thought I would share with you some of the resources that I look at and I'm willing to share this PowerPoint. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll share the PowerPoint with everyone who attended, and I might just put it on the director's list too, just so everyone can enjoy this. <laughs> so, all right. Um, I'm going to start with the updates and proposed laws and changes. Um, and first of all, I was going to cover like a few more updating updates to existing laws, but I was told to wait on that. Um, so one of the things that I would start with, and, and one of the resources I use to keep me informed about what's happening, is the Municipal Minute. I know I've posted this over and over and over again, but I can't highlight enough how important this is. It's our kind of our little wake-up call. It's totally free. We don't have to pay anything for this. And uh, we're getting the same information that like the libraries in the north are getting. You know, it's, it's there for us, let's take advantage of it. And it's a good heads up for, you know, what's coming down the pipe and what the changes are. Because it's just like, as Ellen said, in that first few weeks, I was going like, did you see this and did you see that? And one of the things that really impact us and everyone's delighted about is the change to the Prevailing Wage Act. In June, we won't have to file it online or with our counties because it'll be online. You know, it's like I know when I was a director, I had to file everything in three counties. And it's like the Prevailing Wage Act, this is the law. We, we're just following the law. So this is a very logical progression where we no longer have to make that filings with the various things. And it's all online for people to look at. So, you know, if we have a contractor or something like that, we do have to make sure that they do comply. And of course, that's part of when we, we you know, sign the contracts with them, we make sure that they know they have to be in compliance with the prevailing wage act. So this is a good one. And, um, and then again, Ansel Link, did this great thing in municipal minutes where they they talked about they gave a nice summary of like some of the laws that particularly affect us um and as they said there were 250 new laws that took effect uh, at the first of the year how could we possibly keep track of all of that and know which ones are really relevant and which aren't so this is a nice highlight and brings up some of the things that we should be aware of. You know, it, as you can see, not all of it applies to us, but some of it does. And some of the things that even are under different headings may actually be relevant to us as well. Okay. Um, let's see if I can figure out how to go back. Okay. Um, the Illinois Library Association is also a great resource. And um, as um, Greg pointed out, they do have the, the PPC committee, 
and that's very important and I encourage everyone to follow what's happening with them because they also pay a lot of attention to what our legislators are doing and they know the issues we face. Um, I also thought, I, I really was impressed when I went to ILA and I saw this about how to uh, create and change laws in Illinois. And I thought that was a very interesting, handy step-by-step -step guide in case you ever want to do that. I once worked for um, a system director who didn't like a law. She had me go back to her office with her and she goes, okay, I don't like that law. How are we going to change it? <laughs> like, <laughs> Those of you who may remember Sarah Long know what I'm talking about. And so, yeah, it was like, okay, we'll just go and change that. But this is actually the process. I, I bless Bob Doyle for, for spelling it out quite clearly. So in case you ever want to get excited about a law and you really want to change it, these are the steps. Okay, and then also, um, ILA does this great thing where they produce palm cards. So when we go and meet with legislators, we have topics to talk about. We know what the hot button issues are. And they put them into words so that we can just kind of mimic those back. Because <laughs> sometimes when you get before your legislator, you're kind of a little tongue tied. So this is a great, great service that they provide for us. So I, I suggest you take a, uh, a few minutes to look this over when you have a chance. And I've given you the links to all of these things. So hopefully when you get the PowerPoint, you'll go in and take a, a more in-depth look at some of these things. Okay, and um, another source is every library. And um, they're really great in case you want to uh, move ahead with uh, referendums, um, you know, if you want to expand your library, you can go to these library, these people for help uh, and guidance and advice. Okay, now another topic that comes up constantly on the listserv is FOIAs and OMA compliance. And I know I did an article um, recently for our newsletter about the Open Meetings Act. And so I will kind of just skip over some of that, but there are many government resources that you can go to that uh, really spell it out. And I thought this was the United States Department of Justice, of course, this gives you the um, federal view of the Open Meetings Act. And what's really interesting as I was looking through this is it suggests that you have a self-assessment toolkit and it's like, I'm not sure all of us need to take it to the level that they have, but it kind of like breaks down the process and makes you aware of the different steps and how you should be prepared to handle some of these. And it was really nice because one of the things they suggested is that you create a library of frequently asked materials, you know, that you get asked frequently and, you know, make it so it's available either for your staff to quickly turn around and give the people who are asking for the information or even posting it on your website. And that way you can just direct them to your website instead of having to go through all the process of fulfilling the request. So I thought that was interesting and very helpful to know about. Okay, and then we have the Illinois Attorney General's uh, website. And, uh, you know, it has lots of information about both FOIA and the Open Meetings Act. And this is where you would go to get your training and your trustees would go to get the training. But also, they have the public access uh, counselor. And you can even, you know, this is a person who makes the decisions uh, when there's a dispute on whether something is actually, you know, it, it's like you read all of the decisions that this person makes and it's like they're, it's on the Open Meetings Act and also on FOIA requests. And if there's any kind of dispute, the public uh, access counselor is the one who makes the decisions and says, yes, this was not in compliance or yes, they were in compliance. And I have spoken with her, she's very nice and very helpful. If you ever have a question before you have your board meeting or whatever, or you 
before you, you know, if you have a question on what you need to do for to fulfill the FOIA request, just call. I mean, it's much better to call before you make the mistake as opposed to trying to make it up after you've made the mistake. And you can also just browse through. There's like a frequently asked questions. You can look through previous decisions. A very helpful page to know about. And also, I find that it's useful to look at what the public looks at to you, you know, when they make their requests. So the Citizens Advocacy Center is set up, especially, it's like, it's to help people file their FOIA requests or challenge Open Meeting Act violations if they feel like they have. So it's, this is a good one to look at what they're telling people. And they break down the processes very nicely, step by step. It's in layman's language, so anyone can understand it. So it's just a, a further way to um, broaden your understanding and also understand where the people who are asking for the material are coming from and what information they have been told. Um, this is one directed specifically to the journalists. And um, if you scroll down, it talks about red flags. If they're attending your meetings and you do something, and you know, a red flag will appear. And it's like, okay, when we have our meetings, we don't want to have those red flags. So it's good to just look at what they suggest people look for when they attend their, your meetings. Again, nice breakdown of um, how to find things. And then there's another group. This one focuses mostly on Chicago, but it's the Bud Better Government Organization. And they too have a nice guide to the Open Meetings Act and some other information. And I was also, I think they also have information on TIFs, which is like they're talking about TIF slush funds and all of those kind of things. So I know TIFs are another hot button, you know, topic lately with our directors. So, you know, there's information out there. Um, and I also want to cover some of the existing laws and resources. Um, I have gone to a few of our member libraries and I have noticed that they do not have the sign on their door indicating that uh, because libraries are a branch of, of the government, people may not bring guns into the library. And so it's nice to have that sign out front and there's a great place to go to even get the sign. You can print the sign. Here's the law that talks about Carry firearm carry concealed act. And then this is where you go and you just click here and you can print your sign at no cost to you, which is wonderful. And then just slap it in the door. Okay, and then the wonderful State Library <laughs> website. There are so many great things, and I'm constantly, <laughs> well, I'm not saying this just that you guys are here. No, it's like really, this is a wonderful resource page, and there's a lot of information, and I'm constantly telling people, you know, you can get statistics, you can get all of these things. People don't know everything that's on your website. And I really appreciate Pat when we get new directors. She sends this lovely welcoming email message to them and she kind of highlights things that are on the page. But some, some people, you know, they forget about those things after a while. So it's nice as a reminder, you know, if you're looking for information, just think State Library and go to their website. And there's a nice page here where it directs you, where it's if you're a member of the public, you can go this way. If you're a library, you can go that way. And if you go in as the public, it talks about legislative information, which is really handy to have. So if you know about a Senate bill or a House bill, you can look it up from here. You can go to the state legislator's website directory, or you can official state legislator website. and. Um, you just click on Illinois and it brings up a whole bunch of information, like right here. And you can see all of these things. I know they used to have these in all kinds of notebooks and books. So everything is right here at your fingertips now. It's very handy. 
lots of information, um, even how to contact your legislatures, legislators, excuse me. Um, so, you know, fantastic information here. And then if you go in as the live through the library side, um, you can see Illinois Library Statutes and Administrative Rules. I'm sorry that's still under the, the public side, but it's also good for us too. Nice handy place to find all of the things that we need to, to know about library law and things and the administrative rules that pertain to us. And then there's also the Trustee and Public Library Administrators page. Hopefully you are all familiar with this, have looked at it, directed your trustees to it. And again, it has a real wealth of information. And I, you know, can't stress highly enough how important it is. If you're really following issues, these are places you can go and find out what's happening. Or, you know, even if you want to see an existing law, and sometimes it's like, you know, I pour through the Illinois library law book a lot, have pages, you know, marked. And uh, still, it's like, sometimes it's like, hmm, there are things that I aren't quite covered. And I will occasionally call the state library people and say, you know, I'm looking here and I can't find what it says about this or about that. So I also would say, besides for this lovely website, the staff here at the State Library are also excellent resources as well for, you know, these kinds of issues. And any questions about what I've shared? Anything for Anna? Or any, any other resources people use? Yes, share any resources, that would be great. And as I say, I will put my PowerPoints online. I'll share it with the directors. Um, and, you know, I'll share it with any, I'll look over who signed up today too. We'll put it on the documents for all too. Yeah. Julia is muted currently. I do not see anything online. <laughs> I, I, I do have one comment though. Um, and I, meant to make mention of this during in my presentation, but I think this is the perfect time. So um, of what's been presented here today, especially, and I know it's very public library intense, but yes. with the change of the library systems from 2010 and the merger of the two, there are really two burning issues. And one of them, the big one, is this whole trustee thing. Um, the questions, uh, because the change of the staffs, we're so glad Anna is at Heartland and not it, it, that there's another body down there trying to address this now. Um, the resources aren't across the state anymore. We're seeing a lot of these questions come to the state, which we're fine and happy to uh, address. But clearly, the issue of trustee education, which Ellen spoke of, there's been not that the programs haven't existed in some level, but there's a, been a serious lack of that. Um, so if, if public libraries can do everything possible to have people participate in that, I would love for that March session that's gonna occur here to need to be held in the atrium versus 403 that we have oh, yeah. so many yeah. people interested in needing that. Um, because it, it truly, truly needs to be done. Um, we've seen public library boards kind of vanish suddenly, which is you know, big no-no um, in both library systems. Um, and that, that's a real problem. And you know, reporting back to the state even about um, vacancies on library boards, there's a statute. We're going to be reminding the districts in this state 60 days, you know, it's got to be reported to the state and actually it needs to be filled as promptly as, as possible as well. And then the, what you put together, Anna, is just a wonderful document. I, I would want all of the libraries to truly take that to heart and share that with appropriate staff, but certainly all of the trustees. I think 
at times, and um, I too, when we've gone to online resources, I'm not sure the trustees are actually going online to seek this out. We used to buy those, Dot State Library did, the libraries themselves did, the library systems did, bought those books for the trustees. Um, so they're not following some of those resources. It's, it's something that we really have to address at the state level. Right? Um, so thank you both for those comments and, and uh, for your presentations on that issue. I, I just think that's one of the big burning questions. And that along with um, the unserved and intergovernmental <laughs> agreements, there seems to be a lot of interest in that in the library world. Trustee thing, it's, it's something we, we just cannot overlook in this law and, and the issue. So, thank you. Anna, do you want to talk a little bit, and Amy knows a little bit about it, about the, the test project in the okay. Metro East, and maybe with Amy? Okay. Um, I, well, actually, Ellen was approached by two of our uh, libraries in the Metro East area about trustee training, and she said, Oh, Anna would love to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and she was right, Anna would love to do that. So I met with Ashley and um, Ryan from O'Fallon. Ashley from Caseyville. Yeah, okay, Ashley from Caseyville and Ryan from, yes. And um, we talked about, you know, the, the dire need that we have for trustee training. And it's nice because the Metro East is a very compact area with lots of trustees. Mm -hmm. So we thought we would start off there with some test programs for them. And uh, then Amy said, well, you know, our area would like them too. And so it's like, we'll probably start with the Metro East. Um, we're gonna have a, the Metro East Public Library Administrators meeting, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more with them. But we will probably start off with Amy and her board member talking about the balance between the director and the trustees and their roles. And then from there, we'll ask the, the uh, trustees to attend what other things they would like. And so hopefully, we will eventually take this model and move it around the state because I really think with the trustees, you have to go to them, you know? And so, and I love this state, love, love exploring new, new parts of it all the time, thank goodness, so I'll be doing more of that. And um, I'm really looking forward to that. So I'm hoping this will be a model that um, we can sustain and customize to various areas too, because not areas, not all of the trustees in, these different areas have the same needs. Some of them need more training in this area, some of them need more in that. And so I'd like to be responsive to what the trustees say too. So we're hoping to get this started and, and move it forward. And, you know, I know another area that's, you know, we're also looking at, again, it's like all of a sudden everywhere I turn, the TIF issue is very hot too. And another thing is consolidating units of government too. That's another kind of topic that's out on the horizon without people, you know, really knowing where they're going with that. So that'll be interesting. Those are the things that, you know, we're trying to keep on top of and move forward with. Yeah. Yeah, Ashley said that they have, she has two trustees that will be attending the workshop. Great. I, I have one. I think the, the, the challenge is it's the good motivated ones that go to the trainings and the ones who really need the training. So, yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm thinking maybe we'll have to have some sort of grapple or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, you can win a steak dinner or whatever if you come to the you know, or, you know. Years ago we've done one where we had a um, brunch or something so we had the food yeah but we had a lot of people that actually came and so i think there is a need and you're right there are the people like that but hopefully some as long as you're local enough that they'll make the attempt well my previous training with trustees is like it, a lot of it is word of mouth and if you get those people who come and they say oh this was really a good program and i had fun and i met people from over here and it, you know it's like i would even 
to just, you know, we did like that library crawl. I would say doing a library crawl for the trustees, you know, where you get them in a, in a bus and just drive them, for, just so they see how other libraries do things too. So they get out of their comfort zone and see, oh, there's all kinds of possibilities out there. So, yes, I plan on hijacking people. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, comments, ideas? Not online. That's the end of our formal agenda. Um, however, if anybody has anything they'd like to share with the group as a whole, any announcements, any news, any updates, we'd be happy to hear. I have something I'd like to share. Just a reminder that uh, while we're on the topic of trustees and other things, um, we still have um, a poll that's open on, you can get to it through our website, that uh, we still are looking for folks to complete the poll if they're interested in a position on our board. Um, I know there are several trustee positions on there. There's a public library representative on that if anyone's interested in being on our board. And uh, I'm not looking at anyone in particular. I mean, I'm just kind of, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we don't have a special library right on the board. That's Chris. I'm looking over here. I can't. Sorry. Um, and, um, staff so <laughs> anyway so if you know anyone that's interested I think um, Julia you're going to send out another reminder right and a link to the poll maybe yeah yes yes um, just and it's open through the end of this week for Friday anything okay. else Julia coming in not right now Well, I can thank all of you for participating, for coming. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, we have our next Members Matter meeting will be April 2nd, I believe, at our Carbondale office. So I bet by then it will look like spring somewhere. <laughs> and in that far south, we have a really good chance. So we'd love to see any and all of you either in person or on, online. So, Julia, I think we can call this meeting adjourned. Thanks, Wonderful. Everybody. And for anybody who'd like to join us for lunch, there's a table at Cafe Maxo waiting. <laughs> that was really <laughs> 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 And 